my goal today is just to introduce Hamiltonian mechanics and also maybe say some things about what's the point of it, what are its advantages, and in some sense contrast it with Lagrangian mechanics. Not that they're competitors. But in some sense they are, oh, and that's the reason for the pillars. They are the two great pillars of mechanics. So if I, what are we talking about here? Hamiltonian systems or Hamiltonian mechanics. And references are in the video description down below. One of the two great pillars of mechanics. And what do I mean by that? Well, we've got, maybe I'll do mechanics all capitalized and important. And the way that it's usually first taught is you've got, you know, Newton and Newton's laws. So that involves forces and vectors, but when you want to do more advanced analysis, you sort of get away from the whole vector approach to things. Although maybe that was originally there to help derive stuff. But then we get into this world of um, analytical mechanics. So analytical mechanics looks at systems in terms of, well, either coordinates and momenta or coordinates and their time rates of change. And that's what provides the two big pillars. So let me just sort of split this down the middle. And on the one side, we've got the Lagrangian. I'll say this is either the Lagrangian point of view or the Lagrangian formalism. And on the other side, the Hamiltonian formalism. So in the Lagrangian formalism, you take coordinates called generalized coordinates. So think of this, Q is actually a vector or an n-tuple of say little n degrees of freedom, if you want coordinates that describe the configuration of your system. And maybe your system is made of a system of uh, particles and rigid bodies. And one of the main things about the Lagrangian formalism is that you, you construct a Lagrangian function, which will be a function of these cues that you've chosen. So maybe it's like the Cartesian components of a set of particles, or it's um, the center of mass of a rigid body and Euler angles. And you form this function L, the Lagrangian, and it could also technically involve time. So you've got Q and Q dot, and T, this is just a scalar function L, the Lagrangian function. And the way that it's typically uh, found is it's kinetic minus potential. It's not always that, but kinetic minus potential energy. And then you describe the evolution of this system. So from this, you get Euler-Lagrange equations or the L Lagrange's equations. And you view the system as evolving in the space of Qs and Q dots. So here, if I just had, you know, if N equals two, then I'd have Q1, Q2, Q1 dot, Q2 dot. And you can't really, you know, plot a four dimensional space. But if you start with some initial condition like this dot, then you follow it forward. You know, how does this thing evolve under Lagrange's equations? On the Hamiltonian side, 
So the Hamiltonian formalism, we've got Qs. They might not be the same as these. And you've got uh, momenta as well. So where's the Lagrangian formalism dealt with Qs and Q dots? So that's two n variables. The Hamiltonian formalism, we also have two n variables, but it's Qs and Ps. These Ps are momenta. And they're not the same as just like mass times Q dot. They could be different. So these are momenta, and we say that momentum pi is conjugate to qi. And the same thing, you, you could think of this as coming from a system of particles and rigid bodies, but it's actually more flexible than that. Um, and you can get, uh, well, you get the Hamiltonian function and it could be Q, P, and T, and whoops. The, we typically think of it as coming from the Lagrangian when this is first introduced, but it's actually more general than that. And the nice thing about the, the Hamiltonian is that for systems of particles in rigid bodies, it's usually the total energy. So it's kinetic plus potential energy. So by T, I mean kinetic, V, potential energy. It's always been a mystery, like why for the Lagrangian is it T minus V? That just doesn't even make sense because we all at this point are well aware that energy should be conserved. So total energy should mean something. So why isn't total energy there in the Lagrangian formulation? It's just not. So on the Hamiltonian side, it is. So that's sort of an advantage that the Hamiltonian function is in some sense physical because it is total energy. There's some other things. Uh, the Lagrangian formalism is sort of built out of a I'll say a variational approach. What does that mean? It means that you get Lagrange's equations come from a variational principle. It's called the principle of it's often called the principle of least action, but it's more like the principle of extremum action. And we may or may not say more about that, but it, it's kind of interesting. You look at uh, the integral over time of the Lagrangian from say point A to point B and the thing that minimizes that integral is actually the true path of the system. And there's a formalism using uh, the calculus of variations to actually get Lagrange's equations from that. So there's an optimization principle that gives the Lagrange's equations. On the, the Hamiltonian side, there's also a variational principle, but in some sense, it's just sort of borrowed from the Lagrangian. There's other things that the Hamiltonian formalism can relate to that we're actually not gonna say much about here, but it, it just sort of shows how the Hamiltonian formalism has been more significant to kind of physics and mechanics. So statistical, statistical mechanics based on the Hamiltonian formalism. Uh, if you don't know what I mean, like thermodynamics, ideal gas laws, things like that. Um, so statistical physics involves probabilities of states and the probability of a state is always, this symbol just means proportional to, it's proportional to the exponent of negative H, the Hamiltonian of that state divided by 
uh, Boltzmann's constant times uh, temperature, which also has units of energy. So if you do anything with statistical physics, thermodynamics, um, it's based on the Hamiltonian formalism. There's also just more, uh, we'll say more about this. There's more geometric uh, uh, prettiness. <laughs> it's not really a technical term, but it's one thing that makes it nice. It also generalizes to quantum mechanics. So quantum mechanics is based on the Hamiltonian formalism. So it, the connection between classical mechanics, which came first a couple of hundred years ago, and quantum mechanics, which came about a hundred years ago, it's through the Hamiltonian formalism. You can't, well, that's kind of a bold statement, but I'm gonna say you can't do quantum mechanics with the Lagrangian stuff. So in some sense, Momenta really are fundamental, and time rates of change of uh, a variable is not. And I, I don't know why that is, but it just kind of is. So quantum mechanics is based on the Hamiltonian formalism. I don't expect that you've seen quantum mechanics, but if you have, there's something called the Schrodinger equation, and um, it looks like this imaginary i h bar just Planck's constant the partial derivative of a wave function with time equals the hamiltonian but now seen not just as a scalar function but as an operator on an infinite dimensional hilbert space operates on the wave function and then the wave functions are interpreted in terms of probabilities of where quantum objects are like where is the electron around the atom stuff like that so in some sense quantum mechanics um, based on the hamiltonian formalism is related to things on the smallest scale or physics so let's not no, neglect the Lagrangian formalism, it's got some things that it, it does. Um, general relativity is based on the Lagrangian formalism. And you can kind of see this contrast, quantum mechanics on the one side, general relativity on the other. So this is based on a Lagrangian formalism. And that has to do with uh, well, gravity when gravity is very strong, origin of the universe, cosmology. So the universe on the largest scale. And these two things have not been reconciled, so. Uh, physics on the smallest scale and physics on the largest scale. Um, this has not been reconciled. So at their deepest, the Hamiltonian and Lagrangian formalisms have not been brought together. But that's sort of a large view of the importance of these things. I will say more like, What's the advantage of one over the other? Like, what's the point? Um, they do have a point. I guess I will say more. So I'm a fan of the Hamiltonian formalism. So this isn't uh, unbiased. Uh, especially if you're interested in orbital mechanics. And I know some of you are. Um, Let me list some additional advantages. And it, it, historically, it came later. It was, it's based on someone named Hamilton, not the one that the musical 
is based on. Not that, not Alexander Hamilton. In fact, I don't even know his first name. It's an Irish, Irish mathematician named Hamilton. He also came up with quaternions, but you know, his big thing is this Hamiltonian stuff. So these advantages would be, I guess I'll, I could put it this way. There's just more flexibility to do changes of variables. And we'll say a lot about that. And why would you want to do changes of variables? Well, we know that you, you know, sometimes when you're trying to solve a problem, you do changes of variables to simplify things. Yes, thank you, William. William R Rowan Hamilton. And I think he like famously wrote, scribbled something on the side of a bridge in Dublin. And I was in Dublin a couple of years ago, and I think I went looking for it, but I didn't find it. I was looking also for a pub called Hamilton's, but I didn't, didn't find it. So this more flexibility to do a change of variables uh, makes it easier to solve problems. Um, and these things are called canonical transformations. So just as a preview. canonical transformations because Hamilton's equations are called sometimes Hamilton's canonical equations. Um, there's, there's a method to get in some sense, the best canonical transformation. Uh, from a theory that's called uh, Hamilton-Jacobi theory. Which can be solved in practice for some things. And um, sometimes it can't, but at least it becomes helpful for finding some non-obvious conserved quantities. So uh, there's going to be a few themes like constants of motion, uh, level sets, topology is going to play a role in all of this. In particular, tori and the motion on a torus. Motion on a torus implies uh, quasi-periodic motion. So even if you can't find the best transformation, and so what I mean by the best transformation is you transform your system to everything is an equilibrium point, which might seem really boring. Everything is an equilibrium point, but that is the, if you have a set of differential equations where every point is an equilibrium point, you have the solution for the system because things just don't change. So if you could do a change of variables to a new set of equations where everything's an equilibrium point, then in some sense you have solved your problem. So the Hamilton-Jacobi theory is a way to analytically solve uh, Hamiltonian systems. There is a, we might say second best, transformations. And these are called action angle variables. And if you've taken Lagrangians, a course where they've talked about uh, what are you know cyclic variables or ignorable variables, those are variables where the variable itself doesn't appear in the Lagrangian, and it always leads to some conserved quantity. You could think of it as it leads to a conservation of momentum. There's a way to do a transformation of Hamilton's, uh, of your original set of Q's and P's to some new set where you create new constants of motion. So that's what these action angle variables are. And it uh, you know, shows quasi 
periodic motion on tori. And by torus, like here's a 2D torus, just think the surface of a donut. A 1D torus is a circle. Um, what else? There's, there's a thing called, um, well, Hamiltonian mechanics lends itself to a general and systematic form of perturbation theory. So if you don't know what perturbation theory is, perturbation theory basically says, if you have a system where you understand the solutions completely, and then you slightly perturb it. So you add, you know, epsilon, something small uh, perturbation, um, then you can sort of build off the system that you do know and find out, okay, how are things changed a little bit? So um, there's a form of perturbation theory that you can only do in the Hamiltonian formalism. And it's called, the, the word canonical will be showing up a lot. This is called canonical perturbation theory. And it, it allows you, it's sort of this general and systematic form of per perturbation theory. Whereas with Lagrangians, it's kind of a, a ad hoc and case by case thing. And this is related to near integrable systems. So this means uh, something where you've got a Hamiltonian, where you've got, let's say, um, and you, if you have two systems, you could you just sort of add their Hamiltonians. So if we have a Hamiltonian where H1 is something that is really simple, or we, we know the solution, and then plus epsilon H2, where epsilon is small, then this is the type of situation where you can use canonical perturbation theory. Uh, Part of the geometric prettiness is that there are the, the evolution of Hamiltonian systems under their ODEs. Uh, one of the basic things is it conserves volume. So it's like a higher dimensional version of an incompressible flow. Meaning if you start with a blob of initial conditions, you might say, well, why would I start with a blob? Maybe you start with a blob because you have some uncertainty about where a system started. You start with a blob of initial conditions. As, you, as that blob evolves in time, it needs, to, it needs to maintain its volume. So even if we're talking about a six dimensional system, you conserve that six dimensional volume. And even more than that, there are other sort of lesser things that are conserved that are called the uh, uh, like smaller subvolumes are also conserved. And these are called the integral invariance of Poincare. I think someone else's name is in there, Carton. And you know, how did I get involved in Hamiltonian systems? It started out with orbital mechanics. So if you do anything with orbital mechanics um, beyond the two-body problem, but even the, the two-body problem can benefit from the Hamiltonian point of view. But once you get to looking at the three-body problem, which is sort of the frontier of what people active in orbital mechanics are looking at, the three and the four-body problem, but even the three-body problem, you, you need to, know something about Hamiltonian systems to uh, do state-of-the-art work in it. So I might just say that. So three and more body problems. require a Hamiltonian point of view.
So as more and more, th there's a lot of interest now in space and uh, for those studying aerospace. And now there's more interest in doing things, not just in orbit around the earth, but kind of between the earth and the moon. And that involves the three body problem. So I think we're gonna see that more aerospace engineers are going to have to know something about Hamiltonian systems, even though the vast majority of people getting their bachelor's degree in uh, aerospace have not seen Hamiltonian systems. So if you do see it, then you've got an advantage. Uh, there's more I could say, but maybe I will just leave it. Are there any, any questions about these advantages or it's a lot, but any thoughts? I didn't even mention the connection to fluid dynamics. Two dimensional fluid dynamics that are incompressible can be written as a Hamiltonian system where the Hamiltonian is a stream function. So, so there's that. All right. That's what I want to talk about now. Uh, Oh, I guess I haven't said it yet, but both of these Lagrangians and Hamiltonians can be extended to not just systems of particles and rigid bodies, but to continuum mechanics. And in continuum mechanics, then you get partial differential equations, PDEs. But you could have PDEs that have Lagrangian structure, and you could have PDEs that have Hamiltonian structure, and there may be advantages to each. And um, I'm not sure if I'll go into it more, but maybe. Okay. Um, trying to find something. Let's see, I want to show that. Yeah, okay. All right. Well, I guess since I've said a bunch about Hamilton's equations, or at least the benefits, maybe we should look at actual Hamilton's equations. And I'll do it as you know, Hamilton's equations from Lagrange's equations. You can see Lagr uh, Hamilton's equations is coming about independently, but as an introduction, it's often shown that you could take Lagrange's equations and then transform it. So this is in, if you're looking for something to read, it's section 2.2 .2 of Greenwood's Advanced Dynamics. which I think is something I shared as one of the readings, but the book, it looks like this, right? Advanced Dynamics. He was a professor at University of Michigan. And then I, I've, I've like written in my lot. Um, it's pretty good. It gives, gives a lot of good examples too. So he works out, you know, very engineering type examples. Uh, so that's, this is from Greenwood, if you want. If we have a Lagrangian, so the Lagrangian, I'll look at systems that don't explicitly have time in them. The, the way you get time, it would be like, you have a particle and it's on the surface of a balloon and the balloon is expanding and contracting. So you've got to, with, with time, but you know, let's not look at a case like that. So we're just looking at a Lagrangian that's a function of Q and Q dot. And I will typically be referring to Q is shorthand for uh, the set of all Qs. So from Q1 to Qn, these are the generalized coordinates. And for now, we're gonna assume that there's no constraints so it's an unconstrained system. Uh, unconstrained 
and no non-conservative forces. It's a pretty big assumption. But that's where this theory works the best. And that's kind of why it's pretty good for orbital mechanics, because you don't really have any non-conservative forces out there. Or if you do, they're really small, like drag or whatever, the solar stuff, what's that called? Pointing Robertson drag, solar wind. All right, so Lagrange's equations which are also called Euler-Lagrange equations, are that you take the total derivative d by dt of partial L partial qi dot minus partial L partial qi and set that equal to zero for all of the i's. i goes from one to n. So you get a set of n uh, equations, right? Um, so yeah, think of L is T minus V, potential energy. So this would be, it's a set of N second order ODEs. This is little n, second order ODEs. So basically you get you know, Q1 double dot, Q2 double dot, blah, blah, blah. Qn double dot. So it's set n second order ODEs for the Q variables. And then you could try to code this up, let's say. So these are equations of motion that lead to an initial value problem. So if we have an initial condition, uh, Q at time zero means this n-dimensional point in the configuration space at time zero. But then we also have to specify q dot at time zero. So that's what are the generalized velocities at time zero. And this gives rise to a point, right, in this n-dimensional space. Q1 through Qn, Q1 dot through Qn dot. I'm just sort of abstractly showing. Okay, so this, the initial condition corresponds to a point. Q0, Q dot zero. And then as you evolve forward in time, this will kind of generally go somewhere. I don't know. It'll do something. Unless you have some special trajectories. If you have a special trajectory, like uh, a point where you start there and you stay there. So if there's no motion and you have an equilibrium point, or sometimes people will say fixed point. So I'm just showing that as a green dot. What if you have something um, where you've got an initial condition and it goes around and then comes back onto itself? Well, that's a periodic orbit. And you can have other kind of generalizations. So, okay, there's an equilibrium point, you could have periodic orbits. You could have um, a, a torus where if you start on it, you just sort of evolve along the torus 
I'm showing dashed lines of them on, oops, the opposite side of the torus. What's going on here? And this doesn't necessarily have to like come back onto itself. Maybe it just wanders on the torus forever. So if motion is on a torus, then we have quasi-periodic motion. If we don't have any of these, you could have chaos, which means there are initial conditions where if you start there, it just, the trajectory just seems to wander around forever. Um, and there's ways to quantify chaos. Like if we took another nearby in initial condition, the distance between the two will separate. And that would be called a, you measure that by things called Lyapunov exponents. There's other ways, especially in the Hamiltonian formalism where it's easy to understand what chaos looks like and does. Um, but that's so starting with Lagrange's equation. So these were Lagrange's equations. And if we wanted to, we could transform into Hamilton's equations. So let's do that. So if we want to transform this into the Hamiltonian formalism, we introduce something called, I'll mention kind of up above, we introduce the generalized momentum. Why do we use the term generalized? Well, in Lagrange's equations, we talk about generalized coordinates and generalized velocities. So this is a generalized momentum. So we define it this way, little p sub i, and I'll put three bars to mean I'm defining it. It's partial L, partial q i dot. Doesn't seem like we've done anything amazing, but We kind of have. So this is this would be called the momentum conjugate conjugate to the generalized coordinate QI. So if we've got if our Lagrangian was T, and this could be QI, QI dot minus the potential energy is QI. No, not dot, QI, just QI. When we do this, um, so we've got we've got n of these, right? I goes from one to n, and these need to be invertible. That allows us to write a transformation from the q's and the q dots. So this is a set of two n variables to the same q's, but now the p's. This is called the Legendre transformation, and we'll say more about it uh, later. And it's, it's a change of phase space coordinates. So instead of looking at phase space coordinates that are these Qs and the Q dots, we're now going to be looking at a phase space of Qs and uh, P's, and they might be in different directions. So here's you know, P1 and Pn. So you might just think of it as, okay, we've done a transformation of the phase space variables.
we'll now describe motion in terms of new. I, I use the term phase space. Maybe if you've taken a control course or something else, you've heard state space. In my mind, it's the same thing. So Q1 through Qn, P1 through Pn. And then we, we, um, I guess just to give you an example, let me let me show you. So for if for example, if we have just a one-dimensional system, so if the kinetic energy was one half mass q1 q1 dot squared, right? That's like one half mass v squared. And the potential energy is just a function of Q1. So the Lagrangian T minus V is one half M Q1 dot squared minus V. And it, for now, it doesn't really matter what V is because because V doesn't depend on Q1 dot. So I'm just trying to show if we were to get the generalized momentum partial L, partial Q1 dot. Well, what is this? This is uh, two times one half M Q1 dot. Uh, the twos cancel and we're left with mass times Q1 dot. So, right, this is what you would expect. Momentum equals mass times velocity. The usual definition of linear momentum in the Newtonian world. But of course, this is generalized so that we could have more exotic kinetic energies and we'll get other types of momentum. In particular, for most systems of uh, particles and rigid bodies, you're, you're going to get linear momentum like this and angular momentum. So instead of uh, treating them separately, we just call them generalized. But you could have even more general momentum. And that is, again, part of the power of Hamiltonian systems. Uh, for example, if you've got a charged particle moving in an electric and magnetic field, you get a generalized momentum that is not proportional to velocity. It might, it'll also include like the electrostatic potential. And so you could get lots of weird things, but that help simplify the mathematics. Um, so for in this case, uh, let's just leave that on its own. But we, we need that uh, you can write all of the QI dots in terms of Qs and Ps. And that's all based on um, just these up here, this set of n equations being invertible. So you must be able to write all the qi dots in terms of q and p. So the new phase space variables. And then we define the Hamiltonian function as, I'll write it this way, h. And h has to be a function of just q's and p's. So you can't have the qi dots in there anymore. And this is going to be, it's a sum from 1 to n of the qi dot, but now written in terms of the q's and p's times pi. So you have that sum, and that'll end up being something just in terms of q's and p's, and then you subtract off the Lagrangian, where the Lagrangian will be a function of the q's, and then also the qi dots, which are now a function of the q's and p's. So this is how you get 
a Hamiltonian from a Lagrangian. And then from Lagrange's equations, we get Hamilton's equations. Remember what Lagrange's equations were. You might recognize this thing in the parentheses here. Well, that, that's the momentum minus partial L partial Q I equals zero. Well, this you might look at it and go, oh, hold on. I could re rewrite this as this looks like P I dot minus partial L partial Q I equals zero. And yeah, that's right. And um, it turns out that partial L partial Q I dot is the same as minus partial H partial Q. I mean, partial L partial Q I is the same as minus partial H partial Q I. And so you get Hamilton's equations. And if you want to see you know, more of the steps, if, if it's not clear, you could look in the, the reference material. But you'll get that QI dot is partial H, partial PI, and then PI dot is minus partial H, partial QI. And I goes from one to N. So these are Hamilton's equations, or they're sometimes called Hamilton's canonical equations. Sometimes people might just shorten it to canonical equations. And what is this? This is a set of Instead of n second order ODEs, we have a set of two n first order ODEs for the Qs and Ps. And so this is, this is actually easier to implement on a computer since computers like taking in first order ODEs there would be some work required for you to transform Lagrange's equations up here, which were a set of n second order ODEs. You have to do some work to turn that into a set of first order ODEs. But here it's given for you uh, automatically. So that, in some sense, that's, that's an advantage. So I'm gonna write even more advantages here. Right. Some advantages of Hamilton's equations over Lagrange's equations. Biased, but um, you automatically get first order ODEs. which in this day of doing lots of computations, right? It's easier to implement computationally. So that's good. Um, another thing about it is H, at least if the Lagrangian was T minus V, kinetic minus potential, then here H is uh, kinetic plus potential. So the total energy of the system. So in some cases you could just immediately write down what the Hamiltonian is. You're just writing down the kinetic energy in terms of momenta, like for a particle 
um, the kinetic energy in terms of momentum is just one over two M. And then, you know, think of momentum. If we're talking about like momentum in 3D, it'd be just the magnitude of the momentum squared. So you could just immediately write it down. Um, another good thing is, as we would hope for, <laughs> Uh, this H function is a constant of the motion. You might say, well, what's the big deal there? Well, the Lagrangian function was not a constant of the motion for Lagrange's equations, but here, this thing, the Hamiltonian function is, which becomes useful in terms of understanding what the geometry looks like in phase space, but at a more, let's say, basic level in terms of implementing this computationally, this becomes an easy check on how accurate your numerical integration is. So if you start with an initial condition, that an initial condition has some initial total energy or initial H. And if you see that that H is going down when it shouldn't be, well, you've done something wrong. Maybe you've got the tolerance for your integration isn't good enough. Um, so this can become a, you know, it's constancy can be a check on uh, numerical integration. Even more than that. So there are, this would be like a check if you just use some kind of off the shelf Runga-Kutta code. But there are tools, there are numerical integration algorithms which are based on uh, having a Hamiltonian formulation that will uh, accurately simulate it. And this was initially developed by people studying uh, the, the solar system. So orbital mechanics for over billions of years, to be able to get it right, or at least have some kind of confidence that you're doing it right, you need to be able to accurately simulate Hamilton's equations. And these are called um, symplectic integrators. And so they will, by design, conserve Hamilton's equations. They'll also conserve these other things that are maybe less uh, intuitive, that phase space is volume preserving. So the evolution in this phase space is uh, volume preserving plus all of those other things that are called the integral invariance of Poincaré Carton. So if you use a symplectic integrator, then you would you would get that thing automatically. And one of the books, um, I don't know if I mentioned it in that syllabus thing, but this thing called numerical, I don't know why they covered it, numerical Hamiltonian problems talks about uh, numerical implementation. You could also, I think, find a lot of things online now for how to do it. Sometimes it's not necessary. Like if I do simulation of the three body problem, I just use MATLAB's built-in ODE45. And at least over short timescales, it's fine. But if you want to do really long timescales or have a really challenging problem, you want to be able to get it right, then you need a numerical uh, Hamiltonian simulator. Even for things like the two-body problem around the Earth, because of all of the, if you're looking at something in low Earth orbit, it orbits once every 90 minutes. And if you want to know how it's going to change over months or years, that's uh, hundreds or thousands of orbits. And you don't just have a one over R potential. You've got everything related to, um, you could basically ignore the moon. But 
you've got the uh, the spherical harmonics of the Earth, and all of them can be written as um, kind of higher order terms in the potential energy function. And if you want to be able to simulate that right, I don't know if you know Space Force is doing this or not, but they they should be using symplectic integrators. Uh, I don't know what they're doing. I mean, there's other effects like drag that will be happening over years. And it's sort of a frontier of Hamiltonian systems to know what the effects of non-conservative forces are. Uh, I have a former graduate student, Dreen Zhang, who uh, started look looking at that. You lose some of the geometric prettiness, but you gain in realism. And some of the geometric prettiness sticks around. Um, let me give you a flavor of what this volume preserving stuff is. It's also sometimes called symplectic geometry. I forget what symplectic means, but I think it has something to do with imaginary numbers. There is this, there's a weird connection between Hamiltonian systems and imaginary numbers that we'll just have to talk to on a later date. So what does this volume preservation mean? It means if we, if we have a system like that one up above that was just one degree of freedom. And so if we write it in terms of the Q and P variables, we've got Q1 and P1. Then if we have a blob of initial conditions, let's say a circular blob. So here we just have an area because we've got Q and P, so just an area. If we take this set of initial conditions that we uh, has an area of A naught and then let that thing evolve, it'll evolve into, I don't know, some shape but it has to have, so if we look at the area at this later time, let's call this T naught, here's a later time T1. The area at time T1 has to equal the area at the initial time, at least mathematically. No matter how much this blob uh, gets stretched and folded or deforms in space, I mean, in the phase space. So even if it becomes something that's very, tendrily, and I don't know if, you know if you actually looked at the area of this, if it would be the same, but at this later time, it needs to be the same as it was originally. So volume preserving in 2D means uh, area preservation, because this is actually 2N dimensional. And this is a case of n equals one. So two dimensional volume preservation means area preservation. So volume preservation and area preservation are gonna be these big themes. So quickly, can I uh, ask then? Yeah. Um, so does this does this imply that Hamiltonian systems will never have uh, an attractor? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So that's a good point. Um, and you might. This is something that happened in some earlier research I did where we looked at not a two-dimensional system, but a four-dimensional system. And the student working on it originally wrote it in Lagrange's equations and found that, oh, I, you know, he, he had some, uh, he found a periodic orbit. And he said, well, if I look at a blob of initial conditions, at least over a short time, that blob seems to shrink. So, oh, I've got things shrinking down in my periodic orbit. If you actually wait long enough, well, this little blob actually gets bigger again. In fact, it gets huge. And it just sort of pulsates. So 
with Lagrange's equations, you don't have this volume preservation and you might even come to the wrong conclusion saying, well, if things are shrinking down then maybe they'll be shrinking down forever and I have something that's asymptotically stable. But in uh, Hamilton's equations, you don't, you don't have any attractors. Which, I mean, you don't technically in the, the corresponding Lagrangian system, but it's just more obvious because of this volume preservation property that Hamilton's equations don't permit attractors. An attractor is a state that's stable and brings things in. So this is kind of easiest seen in a situation like this. Like suppose we had a, uh, we've got n equals one. So 2D phase space. Do we have um, a 2D phase space with an equilibrium point? Can it be an attractor? Meaning, are there states that would, you know, kind of spiral into it? And the answer is no. So the only cases you could have would be a stable point. So you could have something that's stable. Let's say the, the origin is our equilibrium point. You could have things that orbit around right, we orbit around and that doesn't contradict volume preservation. So you could have some, you know, volume and it just sort of, it's kind of, looks like rigid body rotation about the, about there. So you could have that. This is a particular kind of stability that uh, is called the center. Because if you got the eigenvalues for that point, you linearize the equations of motion and got the eigenvalues, you'd find that they're both purely imaginary. So no real component at all. The other situation you could have, the only other situation because of volume preservation would be that your fixed point is a, it's unstable, but a particular type called a saddle meaning it has a direction uh, coming in and then a direction going out. And so then if you had a blob of initial condition, say that blob will get stretched, but you could still have volume preservation. You can't have anything else. So you can't have um, a point, a fixed point where things are like spiraling in because that would violate volume preservation, right? Because that means you'd have a, a blob. And if everything is spiraling into that, then the size of this blob has to be getting in smaller and smaller. In fact, you have a finite size 2D volume or area shrinking to zero. So we can't have that a big slash through it. So no attractors. So that is kind of interesting. There aren't any states that are attracting any other states. The best you could hope for is a situation like this. So that's kind of interesting in terms of stability. Um, so just you could think of uh, higher dimensional analogs of this as well. But yeah, there's 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 no attractors. So Good question. Um, it's also a curious thing that these areas, maybe I'll do it as a square, areas in um, the Q1, P1 plane, Like, like this blob here. So if we wrote, uh, here's an area, it's got delta Q1, delta P1. If this came from a particle, 
Well, Q1 has units of uh, distance. And then this has to have units of mass times distance over time. And it ends up um, having the same units or dimensions, same dimensions as uh, dimensions as one of the fundamental constants of nature. And I even showed it up above, Planck's constant, H bar, which is something really small. I think sometimes this is called, uh, these dimensions all, all together are called uh, action. So this has units of action. It's also the same as uh, energy times time. So there might be, you know, there's some hint there that, hmm, okay, maybe this is why there's some connection between Hamiltonian mechanics and, uh, you know, Planck's constant is related to quantum mechanics. So maybe there's some connection there. Um, in quantum mechanics, you've probably heard of the uncertainty principle, right? Delta Q. Delta P, and they would have different interpretations in terms of that, but you get you get something like this. I think it's is it I think it's greater than that, yeah, something like that. This is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle of quantum mechanics, but there are uh, there are classical analogs of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which I think is a cool topic. I haven't really looked at it much. But some people doing um, orbital mechanics are looking at this because it's related to if you if you're trying to track an object, but you don't know exactly where it is, and this would be kind of like, okay, I don't know where it is. So that means it's it's in this blob. Well, if I follow that forward, there's something like Heisenberg's uncertainty principle constraining uncertainty uh, in different components. So if I have, say, X, Y, and Z, there's some relationship between the uncertainty in the X and X momentum and the Y and the Y momentum. So there's, there's some cool stuff there that people are just beginning to find practical uses for, but it's there. Yeah, I went to kind of 75 minutes. So I think I'm going to stop. Okay, well, so next time I'll look at, I'll go over kind of a the change of variable idea, canonical transformation. I'll try to introduce it in a gentle way.